I don't really get nervous when I come up here anymore to preach. Um, Been doing it a long time, but this week I've not slept well, knowing that that this sermon was coming this morning. This is difficult. It's going to be difficult for me personally, I think for us as a congregation. I make it public practice not to get emotional in front of people, so I hope to continue that today. Um, But I just want to stop and pray right now that God would be with us, that he would give us the courage to obey what he has to tell us this morning. Father, I thank you for your spirit that lives within me, that lives within us, your body here at Grace Church. I thank you for giving us strength to to do and say what needs to be done and said. Give us the courage to obey. I pray that I would speak from your heart and not my heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're in core value number three this morning. We believe that doing church as a team is God's design for effective ministry. Many, many years ago, before I showed up here in 2008, Pastor Steve and our elder board worked on a mission statement. They worked on 10 core values. What values make up Grace Church? They worked on an overall strategy. Why, why is this important? Why can't we just come to church and do church and read the Bible together and preach sermons? And why do we need core values? Why do we need a mission statement? We need these things because we get distracted. We're easily distracted from the mission that God's called us to. Who remembers their first time driving all by yourself? I remember the first time I drove all by myself. No instructor, no parent, just me in a 1990 Chevy Caprice Classic. The the front bumper started here and the back bumper stopped somewhere by Don Pyle back there. It was like this land beast cruising down the road. Like, you'd hit bumps, and you just kind of glide over them, right? Like, I hit a bump now, and it's like, but this thing was just, it was beautiful. And this is my first time behind the wheel, all by myself. I'm driving from my parents' house about eight miles to church and on that route was a golf course I wasn't really interested in golf at the time thought it was for old people now I kind of like golf I don't know what that says but I thought I saw one of my buddies golfing I'm driving along super experienced about three minutes into my solo driving career And I see who I think is one of my friends on the golf course. And I'm like, is that really him? It's like zoned in over there. There's this little voice in the back of my head that said, you probably should also look at the road. So I remember turning from rubbernecking at the golf course to back to the road. And I noticed that I wasn't in this lane anymore. I was now in this lane, and coincidentally, there was a guy in this lane who was now going into that ditch because he wanted to avoid a head-on collision. I'm sure all of those events were connected to one another, uh, but I corrected, went back into my lane, and he came up out of the ditch back into his lane. I didn't really make eye contact or look at him. I just was like, okay, cannot get distracted while driving. It's important that we not get distracted while driving. In 
It's easy to get distracted when there's lots of interesting things going on, lots of stuff to look at. The American church is distracted. Grace Church is distracted. I'm distracted. Because of that distraction, I believe we're failing. The reason we have a mission statement is to call us back and point us down the road where we're supposed to be going. Our mission statement is to know Christ and make Christ known. The reason we have 10 core values is to point us back to those seven words. To know Christ and to make Christ known. Take Satan out of the equation. I'm fully capable of distracting myself. Satan didn't just like take that guy who looked like my buddy and put him on a golf course. I did that my, myself, right? We don't need him to distract us. But guess what? He wants to distract us from our mission. Our core values call us back to that mission. Today's core value is we believe that doing church as a team is God's design for effective ministry. We believe that we're better together. We believe that God designed us to live in community. In order for us to reach our full potential as a body, but also our full potential as individuals, we need to act as a team. So thinking in terms of team, what's the goal of a team? I come from the school where the goal of a team is to win. That's like the old school. Now, you know, I've coached, just have fun. Just have fun. I tell my players, or told my players back when I coached them, you know what's fun? Winning. Winning's fun, so we're going to have fun. We're going to play to win. So what's a win look like for Grace Church? If we're going to be a team that God has designed, what does a win look like? Thankfully, Jesus lays it out for us, what a win looks like. He tells us in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it's called the Great Commission, it's called your job, it's called what we are called to as a body. And Jesus came and said to them, this is right before he beams up, before he ascends into heaven, right before he leaves us. This is what I want you to do. Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me Verse 19, go therefore and make disciples. That's evangelism, right? You're going to create disciples. Discipleship's an ongoing process, but that act of making disciples, creating them, taking them from lost to found is called evangelism. That's job one or job 1A. Job 1B, baptizing them, right? Attaching them to a body, when we baptize someone here at Grace Church, it's like they put a name tag on that says, hi, my name's John, I'm a member of the body here at Grace Church. It's a public proclamation of obedience to Jesus. I'm attaching to his body. We do it right here several times a year. I want to obey Jesus. I'm part of his body. That's what baptism is. So 1A, make disciples, evangelize, share your faith. 1B, baptize, right? Job 1C is to teach them to live as Jesus lived. Starting again in verse 19. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Job 1C, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always 
to the end of the age. Jesus says, all authority is mine. I came here as God, became man, died for you, rose again after living a perfect life so that you could have victory over sin and death. I am in charge. That's what he's telling you. I rule the universe. Listen to what I have to say. This is what I want you to do. Make disciples. Teach people how to live as I lived. Baptize them. Baptize them into the body. We're going to talk a lot about the body today and why it's so important. These three things are what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be about these three things. They are our calling card. They are the reason our 10 core values exist. When you get baptized here at Grace Church, you are baptized into the body of Christ, into the church. Jesus wants us to grow his church. Why? Second Peter 3 tells us God doesn't want anyone to perish. He wants that no one should perish. He is patient. He's waiting. He's waiting for the church to do her job. He's waiting, us, waiting for us to fulfill our mission. He wants that everyone should be saved. This is the hard part. Because I love this church. It's been my home. I've had great memories here. I've had painful memories here. I believe that we're failing. This church is not growing. Every week I get a report. In that report, it tells me how many of you show up on a Sunday. It also tells me how we're giving. It doesn't tell me who's giving. It doesn't tell me how much you're giving. But it tells me how giving is going at Grace Church. Attendance and giving are two indicators of church health. Attendance and giving are consistently, steadily, gradually contracting, shrinking here at Grace Church. Our mission is too important for us to be getting weaker. If we are going to fulfill our mission, this cannot be the case. Why is this happening? I've been thinking about it a lot. Probably why I haven't been sleeping very well. I believe it's because we're distracted. We're off mission. Reaching the lost is more important than anything that is distracting us. Listen to this quote from C.S. Lewis. If heaven and hell exist, nothing else matters. If heaven and hell exist, Nothing else matters. If heaven and hell don't exist, then nothing matters. We need to wrestle with that quote. And if our lives are consistent with the truth of God's word. I've identified three needs that the church body has. I'm not terribly bright. I was able to look at scripture passages that were given to me back when these core values were put together, and out of those, I've identified three needs that the church body need, has. In order to be healthy and robust, we need, number one, diversity. We have a preconceived idea about what diversity is. For our purpose, 
this morning, it's different gifts, different perspectives, different people, individuals. We can't all be like me. That would be terrible. We can't all be like you. We need diversity. This morning, we're going to be learning from the Apostle Paul. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 12, if you'd turn there now. He lays some things out for us that are markers of church health. Diversity is one of those. We can't all be the same. He uses the analogy of the body to help us understand the importance of diversity. Verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all of the members of the... Let me start over again. Reading's hard. Verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them as he chose. Verse 19, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So why is diversity important? Because we need different gifts. We need different personalities. We need different perspectives to function properly. All of our parts are designed for a task. Paul likens it to the human body. Imagine if the whole body were an eye. How would you hear? If the whole body were an ear, how would you smell? But God in his wisdom arranged us, the members of the body, each for a specific purpose. He chose each one. Those two verses tell us a lot about the Christian life. Number one, we need each other. I need you, whether you like it or not. You need me. We need each other. If we all had the same gifts, the same perspective, the same personality, we would have big problems. We would have blind spots. We would have misshapen priorities. We would not be capable of doing the work of the kingdom. You were designed for a purpose. You were brought here to this body in 2021 for a purpose. Discover that purpose and fulfill it. A foot is really good at being a foot. But have you ever tried walking on your knees? You can kind of do it. You can get around on your knees. It's not very efficient. It's pretty painful. But you can do it. You can get by. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physical therapist. But I can imagine if you walked around exclusively on your knees, you would eventually do some permanent irreparable damage to your body by misusing it. 
by making it do something it was not designed to do. We need feet around here. You need feet. We need to do what we're good at. What if feet decided to stop walking? What if they decided to stop serving the body? They atrophy. If you stop using something, it atrophies. Use it or lose it. It's in the Bible. What does atrophy mean? To gradually decline in effectiveness or vigor due to underuse or neglect. If you can hear my voice, whether you're here in person, you're watching me on a screen, Grace Church needs you. Grace Church needs you. We need your gifts and your abilities. You were gifted for a purpose. God brought you here intentionally. You're a part of his greater tapestry here at Grace Church. You need to discover and use your gifts. Are you familiar with the parable of the talents? For the most part, let me explain it to you real quick. So Jesus tells this parable of the talents. A master has three servants. He gives each servant a certain amount of money. The denomination is called a talent. Okay? The first two servants basically double their money. They take that, whatever this, this master gave them, and they double it. The second guy, he's afraid, insecure, whatever the case may be. Sinful, not faithful, poor servant, I don't know. But for whatever reason, he takes that, what the master gave him, he buries it. He doesn't use it, doesn't invest in it. Well, one day the, the master comes back and he rewards the first two servants. He said, look what you've done. You've taken what I've given you. You've doubled it. You've used it to make my kingdom better. Good job. Here's more responsibility. Here's more reward. The third guy gives it back, and that's it. There's nothing to go along with it. He has nothing to show for his work. And the master deals with him harshly. This guy makes excuses. He doesn't really have a good answer why he didn't do anything for the kingdom. As one of the shepherds here at Grace Church, it's my job to warn you to make sure that's not you. I don't want that to be you. I don't want that to be me. I don't want to get distracted by something and not use what God's given me to make his body, you people whom I love, stronger and better and more like Jesus. I don't want Jesus to be disappointed when you stand before him and I don't want you to be disappointed when you stand before him. But rest assured, each day one of us will stand, each and every one of us will stand before him. Jesus didn't tell us this parable to entertain us. He didn't have a copy editor who's like, hey, look, the Bible's got to be so long, so you just got to throw stuff in there until it's long. No, it's there for a reason. The old statistic is true at church. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. I don't want you to stand before God one day and get judged harshly because you were a poor servant. I'd rather warn you now and make you a little uncomfortable, maybe a little irritated with me, than have judgment day go poorly for you. I've got to use my gifts, part of my spiritual 
gift inventory is irritating you, so I apologize for that. But we have to tell the truth. When the truth's there, we have to tell the truth. And that may sting a little. You need to be using your gifts to make the body stronger. We are the bride of Christ. We need to get ready to stand before him one day. Need number two, I believe, that the Apostle Paul identifies for the body is wholeness. The body needs to be whole to function properly. We're going to be back in 1 Corinthians 12. Now we're in verses 21 through 27. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts, we treat with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. Verse 25, that there may be no division in the body. If you would underline that, I would appreciate it. But that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. No one's perfect. I have weaknesses. One of my weaknesses is that I lack subtlety. I'm not subtle, not sophisticated. Some pastors intentionally take the cookies and put them on a lower shelf. They take the truth of God, the truth of his word, and they try to make it as accessible as possible. My flaw is that I will take those cookies and throw them at people. And I don't want to do that this morning. I want to be cautious this morning because there's a lot going on. But the truth of God's word does not change depending on what's going on. The body is designed to be whole. You are indispensable. We need you here. We need you here. Whether you're watching me at home, on your couch, or you're here in this room but not engaged, we need you here. We need you engaged. We need you using your gifts. If we are to know Christ and make Christ known, we need you. We need some subtle people. We need diversity. We cannot do it without you. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. You are indispensable. Whether you're at home or you're here, you're indispensable. Just like each part of your own body is designed to be in harmony, we need you here to function properly. Now I understand that there's a pandemic going on. And I want to encourage you as lovingly as possible to wrestle with that. Don't just say, I'm not going. I'm going to do church on my couch. Wrestle with it. Get before God in his word. Hear what he has to say. Then make that decision. We have to wrestle with it. I implore you, do not permanently disconnect yourself from the body. God has arranged for you to be here. He has all authority. He has formed this body here in Gladstone, Grace Church, with you in mind. 
with you in mind. Take that personally. You make us whole. You may think to yourself, God has not given me much. I am not a servant with a lot of talents. I'm not gifted. I am what they call inconspicuous. God wants you here. Why? Look at verse 22. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. You're needed here. And those parts that we think are less honorable, we bestow with greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. God wants you here. You are special. You're important. You're indispensable. Some people are upfront people. Some people are behind-the-scenes people. If we're going to know Christ and make Christ known, we need you all. God designed you to be behind the scenes. If you're a behind the scenes person, God designed you that way. I want you to thrive behind the scenes. Because the work that happens behind the scenes is just as important, if not more important, than the work that happens front and center. God didn't mess up when he made introverts. God didn't mess up when he made extroverts. He didn't make a mistake. You may feel like a third wheel. You may feel like you don't fit. Trust me, you fit because we serve a God who does not make mistakes. Amen? These verses are for you. You are in dispensable. You may be at home right now, if you haven't turned me off yet, watching on your couch. You may be disconnected for another reason. It may not have anything to do with the pandemic. Look at verse 25. That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. You're on your couch right now. Pastor, I've got my reasons. Right? Look around us. You don't have to be on Facebook very long. You don't have to watch the news very long. You don't have to look at any poll anywhere on anything to know that we're divided. We are divided in this country. And you might be sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of it. I'm sick and tired of being divided. What I really hate is that division has crept into our church. And I hate it. And there's part of me who wants to say, check you later, because this isn't what the body's supposed to be. But I can't. I cannot. I cannot check out because... The body is meant to be whole. So what are we going to do with this division? Are we going to fight about it? Can't do that either. What's it say? Verse 25, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If your politics annoy me, I still need to have the same care for you. If your vaccine stance annoys me, If I disagree with it, guess what trumps that? My care for you. Uh, Pastor Tim, myself, Pastor Jordan, Pastor Dave, we were at a conference this past week, our annual meeting for Converge Great Lakes. A bunch of pastors and church leaders from like-minded churches around Wisconsin and Upper Michigan all got together. In some ways, it was like a COVID pastor support group, right? We all get together, and one of the things that, like, jumped up and punched me in the face was a pastor said, we begrudgingly made a policy about masks. 
because it needed to be done. People on both sides left the church. We are in a climate where you can't make anyone happy. If you stand for something, someone's going to be upset with you. What do we do with that? Verse 25 says, I have to submit my right to be upset and care for the members of this body. Even if they irritate you, annoy you, argue with you, or you argue with them in your brain and you never say a word, anyone have any of those inner dialogue arguments with people? Stop doing it. Jesus died for them. You will never argue with someone on Facebook Jesus didn't die for. That Jesus doesn't desperately want to be a part of his body. I'm guilty. Guilty of that. We need to repent of that. We need to turn from that. We need to be more passionate about Jesus and the gospel and the lost, dying people around us than we are about vaccines, than we are about masks, than we are about political parties. Why? C.S. Lewis tells us why. If heaven and hell exist, nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. And if they don't exist, then nothing matters. We have, we have to grasp hold of that. We have to recalibrate, as my GPS tells me. We need to take our eyes off of this world around us and put them on Jesus. Because heaven and hell are real and nothing else matters. I'm going to make you go on record this morning. Raise your hand if you believe heaven and hell exist. All of us raised our hand. Nothing else matters. Your career does not matter. Your happiness doesn't matter. Your rights What's everything mean? Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. God, forgive me. The wrong things have mattered. The wrong things have mattered. Let me be more subtle. Nothing else matters. How you feel about vaccines, masks, Republicans, Democrats, your Second Amendment rights, nothing else matters. What matters? That there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. I want to make you stronger. I want to make you more robust spiritually. Why? So that we can know Christ and make him known. One day each one of us will stand before Jesus and he's going to ask us what we did with our time, our talent, and our treasure. Imagine saying, well, I got masks banned from our school. I got my, my guy voted into office. I got really good at my hobbies. We camped a lot. Junior got really good at hockey, soccer, basketball, baseball, football. I want to make sure I step on anyone's toes so you don't be like, is he talking about me? You should ask the question, is God's word talking about me? Because it is. And it's talking about me too. Each one of us are going to stand before him 
And he's going to ask us, what did you do with it? That life I gave you, what did you do with it? I got really good at bow hunting. Now it's getting personal. Not that I'm really good at bow hunting, but I would like to think I could be someday if I spend enough time at it. What are you pursuing? What are you pursuing? At the end of the day, here is why meeting together as a body matters. You cannot one another each other in your pajamas from your couch. It cannot be done. What does it mean to one another someone? This afternoon, this is your homework assignment. Google one another from Scripture. There are several verses throughout the New Testament telling us what we should do and be for one another. We have to be with each other in person to do that. If not, we will continue to contract in our attendance, in our effectiveness, until we reach critical mass and we close our doors. If you are sitting there thinking, that's hyperbole, that, that's not going to happen. I'll always be here, I'll always come. If you could see the stats on church doors that closed in 2020 and so far in 2021, you would be astounded. You would think, maybe it can happen here. We cannot love one another from our couch. We cannot serve one another from our couch. We cannot admonish one another from our couch. We cannot encourage one another. We have to be in person together. I understand there's a pandemic going on. I understand that you may be annoyed and irritated and struggling with other perspectives people have here in the body. But if Heaven and hell are real if they exist. It doesn't matter. It was my goal to step on everyone's toes in that one. Okay? I don't want anyone to feel left out or singled out. I hope I did a good job. Need number three. We need to build the body. The church has a big job to do. If we are to know Christ and make Christ known we will face adversity. Jesus said, we will face adversity. People are going to hate you because of me. Not me, Jesus. You might be mad at me right now. Hopefully it's because of Jesus. If we're going to face this adversity, the body needs to be strong and robust. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16 is the key to spiritual bodybuilding. Verse 11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood and womanhood. Underline mature there. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, human coming, cunning, and craftiness in deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Paul starts with diversity again. He gave us prophets, apostles, evangelists, lots of different job titles and functions. But why? 
to equip the saints, that's you guys, for the work of the ministry, for building up the body, also you guys, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Paul is telling us that it's our job to make each other stronger. It's our job to work and build up his church. Why do you think Paul brings up unity in verse 13? Because it's our unity that makes us strong. It's our unity that Satan attacks. He tries to tear us down to make us weaker so we won't reach the maturity Paul's talking about. He wants us to continue to be children. Paul says we need to be strong so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves. We're getting tossed to and fro by the waves right now. I firmly believe that. As a nation, we're acting like children. On both sides of the political aisle, in the church, we're acting like children. That division has crept its way in. We get caught up in schemes and in cunning. It hurts me to say this because I'm just as guilty. Because we're falling for these things and getting distracted, it shows me I'm not very mature. And it shows me we as a church are not very mature. Not as strong as we should be because our eyes are off Jesus. And they're on everything around us like a 16-year-old kid driving by a golf course, running people off the road. This is the beauty of Jesus Christ dying for us. It's not too late. We're not too far gone. We're never too far gone. We can repent. We can turn from those things that divide us. Paul tells us how. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We need to speak the truth in love. That has been my goal this morning. To tell us as a body hard things in love. I haven't done it out of spite. I haven't done it out of anger. It's because I love this body. This place has been my home for nearly 14 years. I've taught your kids. Buried your parents. I love you. And I want to see you grow. I want to see you reach your full potential for Jesus. I'm not very subtle. I apologize for that. But I want to see us become a church on the move. When I moved here in 2008 from New Jersey, I came from a pretty dysfunctional church with a dysfunctional leadership team. When I came to Grace Church in 2008, it was like a breath of fresh air, like wind in my sails, like I could serve this church forever. Over the past 14 years, I feel like we've changed, and we've seen a thing or two, right? Stuff's happened here. I'm not denying that. But I feel like we've lost that church on the move. The people of Grace Church were hungry for the word of God. Starving for it. Wanted it. I'm not getting that vibe anymore. I don't know if that's me. I don't know if it's you. I have a feeling it's both of us. Would you take some time with God this week? 
and tell them no matter what, I will submit to your word. I will get into it. I'll let it change me. Jesus died for you. He says, all authority has been given to me. We owe him everything. We owe him everything. We need each one of you here. If you call Grace Church your home, we need each one of you here. If we're going to build up this body and face the adversity that's coming. In conclusion, you're almost out. If you're still with me, if you're still listening, this sermon was not meant to be a guilt trip. I do not like guilt trips. I don't want you to feel bad. I don't want you to feel bad for not being here or maybe for showing up but not engaging. I don't want you to feel bad. I want you to wrestle with why. Wrestle with your reasons. I want you to wrestle. I want you to get before God and get in his word and hear from him. Why? Because one day you will be before God and you will hear for him, from him. I want you to do it now when you can change. When the, the test hasn't been turned in, when the book hasn't been closed. I want you to hear from God now. And I want you to recalculate. And I'm telling myself that just as much as I'm preaching it to you. What will God say about this era in our lives? In 2020, 2021, did the church stand tall? Did the church stand tall? When the pandemic squeezed us, what came out? When it put pressure on us, how did you respond? We believe that doing church as a team is God's design for effective ministry. I believe that. That is one of my core values. Is that one of your core values? Do you believe that? If heaven and hell are real, then nothing else matters. And if they're not real, then nothing matters. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this body. I thank you for Grace Church. I thank you for bringing my family here, integrating us into this body almost 14 years ago. Father, forgive me for why I failed in serving them and loving them and teaching them and admonishing them. Forgive me for where I failed in listening to them in learning from them. We repent of that and we turn from it, God. That's the beauty of Jesus in the gospel. It's never too late to change, to make a course correction. We want to honor you. We want to please you. We want your body to be strong and robust. We want to know you and make you known here in Delta County and around the world. You are a good, good father. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for Grace Church. In Jesus' name.